Merci. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the special CNBC Africa broadcast. I'm Nozi Pombandra. We're breaking away from normal programming to bring you a live conversation from Essence Festival Durban. And this conversation is going to be exploring the business case for the promotion of the growth and competitiveness of black-owned businesses in South Africa. And joining me in the conversation, I'm joined closest uh, to me uh, by Mr. Musa Makunga. He is the president of the Durban Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I'm also joined by Mr. Philip Stoller, acting deputy city manager, responsible for the economic development and planning cluster at Eteguini Municipality. And uh, visiting us from Zimbabwe, from Bulawayo, we have the acting town clerk, Madame Sikangela Zhu, who joins us as well in this conversation. Thank you very much for making the time to join us. And perhaps the good starting point is uh, to start off uh, with you, Philip, and, and, and that's really to start where the conversation is being hosted and maybe get an understanding of what visible plans has the city made to show that it is being deliberate about the support for black businesses here? Well, there's uh, quite a number of things that we are doing as the city. Um, one of them, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a list of them. I mean, the first one is to ensure that we revive what is called township economies. Mm -hmm. um, we are, as a city, uh, in this financial year, we have set aside uh, millions of friends to uh, revive the economies in the townships. Um, for example, we are in the south of Deben. We are going to have uh, an auto supply in Umlazi, uh, which is funded by Etewin, Etewin Municipality in terms of the infrastructure. Just giving you one good example. In the north, we already have the construction incubator um, that we have been funding, I mean, for years now. Maybe the question would be why we are doing these things. Mm. These are, I mean, we've got a lot of programs that we are doing in the north of Deben, which are worth billions of friends. Uh, we provide infrastructure as council uh, to support uh, uh, catalytic projects in the north of Deben. And this is money that is paid by ratepayers. And we want to utilize, and the mayor yesterday was talking about these things, that we want to utilize this money, part of it, as part of radical economic transformation. And the reason why we, we established the, uh, the incubation program in the north, it was in, in anticipation of projects that are worth billions that were coming uh, to be, that were to be implemented in the, in the north of Deben. So that was a response. Um, it's a response to the call for radical economic transformation because our view is that if you live in Inanda or in Guamash, you don't have to leave Guamash or Inanda. Uh, to make money. I mean, right. you can still be there, but do have projects in Umhlanga. Mm. If we have a bulk infrastructure in Umhlanga, we want a business uh, from Tuzuma or from Phoenix to be able to, uh, to supply either a, a, a product or to do construction in the north of Deben. So, I mean, this is the same thing that applies to the, uh, to the West. There are zoning plans that we're about to approve, and if those projects kick off, they will be worth more than 30 billion rent in the next 15 years. It's certainly encouraging to see that there is a list of uh, projects that if we spent uh, the next hour, you could walk us through all of them. But I guess the more pertinent question then becomes, are these projects viable and have they proven successful in the, to the extent that they have met the targets, the number of black businesses that you want to see coming out of those spaces and the quality of those businesses as well as the size of those businesses. So if you were to give us some insights around some of the success, success metrics uh, that you have coming out of those, uh, uh, those particular programs and projects, what are you most proud of? Well, firstly, we are proud that, um, in, I mean, for decades now, the private sector, the major developers uh, in this city, they have been um, developing the city, but not taking into account the fact that we've got small black-owned businesses that must be, uh, um, I mean, that needs to be supported. 
Um, so the first success thing was to engage with big developers. Mm. Uh, I won't mention them by names, but we have agreed with them that uh, there will be a certain amount of money set aside. One of them has agreed that in the projects that we are going to do uh, in the next three years, in fact, which is uh, it's something that is available now, uh, we are going to go through, in partnership with them, we are going to go through a supply chain process. But those projects are worth more than 476 million rand. Mm -hmm. So it's 476 million rand from private sector. It's something that was not there before. before. And for us, and for Etewin Municipality, we are proud of that, that besides our own budget, we are now, in terms of the projects that are taking place in the north, uh, the quick win that we have is, is worth more than 476 million rand. Mm. Again, another uh, uh, quick win is the fact that in the, um, uh, at the Devon Beachfront, we are extending the promenade, uh, yeah. the beachfront uh, promenade by about three kilometers. And that project is worth, yeah, it's close to 400 million rand. Now, if you talk radical economic transformation, 30% of that must go to uh, black suppliers and black contractors. But our aim is to go beyond 30%. It could be 45% or more. And the, pro the, the tender is about to be awarded. But we as, we, as the municipality and our stakeholders, we are the ones who are going to supply the list of companies that must be considered for subcontracting. In the past, companies used to have their own subcontractors. The, I mean, the big five. Yeah in the construction uh, industry used to come with their own um, uh, subcontracts and, 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 and subcontractors. So if you are talking about success stories, and as far as we are concerned, this is a success story that city will be spending so much money, but more than 30% of it will be going to, uh, to, the, small, uh, I mean, to the small contractors. So I've, I've, I've given you the, the easy part of the question, and that is, of course, uh, the quick wins and the success stories. I'm going to come back to your headaches in a moment because we have to talk about the things that keep you up awake at night as well. But let's go to the chamber. It's far easier for government to be deliberate and to be bold about putting, to, uh, about um, unapologetically supporting black business. But one would think that as a chamber, your members are not just black business. Uh, and there are businesses that may not necessarily uh, have the same political alignment or affiliation. So. What has been the experience of the Chamber of, uh, of Commerce and Industry to um, put together and push for a black business agenda, if any? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as the Durban Chamber of Commerce and Industry, as you quite rightly point out, you know, our members are made up of uh, large, uh, small, medium, and micro, um, small, uh, medium uh, enterprises. Um, our position as the chamber is that um, our sole reason for existence is to facilitate trade and therefore bring together um, uh, lawmakers, the government, and the business community. Mm -hmm. um, we have support from our um, members to set up um, what, we, uh, what is known as the uh, uh, private-public uh, partnerships. Mm -hmm. There are specific programs that we run together with the municipality, with the city, and together with our members. Sure, it hasn't been easy. Yeah. As a result, um, we are embarking on a, on a drive to say to our members, you know what, we are in business for a better world. Mm. So we are engaging in these ongoing conversations with our members that actually it would be very good for business to partner with other players mm. in order to make sure that we, um, we work towards uh, a, a society mm. that is prosperous. Right. Uh, it is a fact that the majority of, um, uh, of our society, in, in so far as business is concerned, is really languishing in the informal sector. Mm. And uh, a lot of people find themselves in that informal sector due to high levels of unemployment, uh, poverty, and uh, inequality. And therefore, we are really pushing that agenda that we should have this, to the extent that we have got what we call the enterprise, um, uh, enter enterprise uh, development um, uh, initiative Program, yeah. programs that we are running to make sure that we bring people into the mainstream of uh, mm. business. 
I think you've given us a really solid answer, but I'm going to push you a little bit because sure. I think in the conversations uh, that are happening and taking place within the chamber, I'm sure they are getting heated at some point because there must be sticky points, tension points, because if we are really going to see uh, the unapologetic promotion of black business in particular, some trade-offs have to be made between established businesses that are not non-black in the main. If you could give us just a sense, one, two, maybe even three points, what are the biggest concerns that are coming from the other members in the chamber that are, that are perhaps not as comfortable about the idea of unapologetically promoting the growth and competitiveness of black business? What are they concerned about? Well, the, 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 the biggest issue that uh, the business community is concerned about is um, the corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, the high levels of, co of corruption to the extent that um, <clears throat> the, 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 the uncomfortable discussion ends up being, um, look, with these high levels of co corruption, we don't think we want to put our money there because we are not sure that it's going to serve what, what, what it should serve. On the other side as well, uh, the government would say, well, you know what, it takes uh, two to tango. Absolutely. So the business community cannot stand on the side and shout at us because we know very well that somebody somewhere is corrupting someone else. Uh, grappling with this tension, mm. we have decided to come up, and this has been, um, uh, was launched quite recently with a, a code of ethics for businesses doing business in our area mm. to say there are these eight principles that you have to abide by if we are conducting business here, all with the aim of actually dealing with the concerns that they are, that they are raising, mm. one of which is this of, of, of corruption. And therefore, we are saying to our members, um, anyone who's dealing with government, they are, there's this principle that you have to abide by so as to ensure that um, you stay on the right side of things, because we do know that unfortunately with corruption, what ends up happening is that what is aimed at creating a better world for a society ends up in the pockets of a few. Mm. Um, and we are not going to be able to deal with poverty if we allow that to, to go on. I think you raise a very important point that is certainly a point worth discussing, and that is the equation of black business to corruption, which of course, if you go back to the example that was made earlier about the construction companies, we know the amount of collusion and corruption that has taken place in that particular sector, and it is not a sector that is dominated by black players. So there is a narrative that needs to be challenged. There is a narrative that we need to actually unpack. But let's go to Bulawayo first. Um, because again, when we start thinking about Zimbabwe, uh, from a policy perspective anyway, uh, the indigenization policies uh, come uh, to, to mind. And in South Africa, we begin to compare this with our own black economic empowerment and the likes. But let's take a step back from that, madam, and ask the question, what has been you, the Zimbabwean and the Bulawayo experience in particular of being unapologetic about supporting the growth and the competitiveness of black businesses? Uh, thank you for the question. I think taking off from where my colleagues were speaking from, uh, as a city, we realized after independence, we have been independent longer than South Africa, obviously, and so we have walked the path. Uh, despite our macroeconomic environment, which may not be supportive of business, whether black or, or, or white, we have tried as a city to support the black businessmen, and our thrust has not been to bring down the white businessmen, but rather bring up the black businessmen to the level of where the others were. And in that, after independence, we did start some factory incubation uh, units, mm. which we put, and black business people could rent those places, and at the same time, we made industrial land available for those people, and we're saying, your lease should be 10 years. That was the concept when we started the incubation factories. And we're saying, while you are leasing, you buy a stand where you can be developing your factory, and then you can move on to be an industrialist. We also had the smaller shops that were in, mainly in the high density areas, which were built by the municipality. And we said, rent these shops if you want to be in commerce. Rent these shops, but in the meantime, 
We are building new setups and we are providing commercial centers in all these new setups. You then move on to buy your commercial stand where you can then own it, get title, and then you increase your competitiveness because then you can be you bankable because you have got title now. Also, like the factory incubators, they would move from the factory incubators to the industrial stands, which fortunately we still have a lot of land, which we still is available for the black person to, to buy and, and build factories. But we realized also that um, most business people are in certain businesses, black business people. Like your transport, I'm sure it's the same mm. here in South Africa you have um, the commuter omen buses. They're just the black people. But we realize that the world is moving towards mass transportation. Yeah. And for you to be in mass transportation, you need capital to be together and also buy the, the big transportation vehicles and, and develop into a business proper. So the city came up with a transport policy. The transport policy really, is trying to push people, the, the various commuter operators, into aggregation, which has been spoken yeah. about by the earlier section. Aggregate and form, we are not as big as, as Etegwini. We are smaller. So we said form three companies in the whole city and we'll divide your areas of operation. Mm. And when you pull your resources together and form yourselves into companies, you'll avoid a big player from somewhere coming in and taking your space because you'll occupy that space as an aggregated unit mm. and you, you then transform yourselves into a proper business entity that can then try and compete and be bankable and be able to, to provide everything that the financial institutions will want from a business. Because as a, with the motor just a one mm. and the chovis are just going up and down, you will not make it. Yeah. You, you won't be bankable. But if you come together and you form a transport company and you have an area that is exclusively yours, we are agreeable to exclusively reserving for the three companies so that they can transform. Mm. That is still at its infancy. We're still trying it. They have formed the companies, but we're still training them to become businesses because we realize that while they formed the company in the evening, Udube still cashes his own money. Right, right. <laughs> and yeah. Lovu cashes his own money. But we're trying to transform So, we, so we're, going, we're going back to this idea that uh, aggregation seems to be uh, yes. the ideal way to go yes. in theory, but there are some teething issues yes. in terms of actually moving from a competitive uh, mindset to yes. something that could be even called co-opetition, where yes. we're collaborating even though there is some degree of, yes. of competition. Let me come back to your headaches because I think these are important for us to understand. If we're saying that there are specific policies and specific programs that government is leading to ensure that there is, the, there is growth of black businesses, there is competitiveness of black business, what remains a challenge? What remains stubborn? What still keeps you up at night irrespective? Well, I think government can, can do so many things as we are currently doing. But the reality is that um, there's still a lot of fronting uh, people working for, for big business. And we tend to um, you know, uh, speak negatively about uh, such behavior, uh, but we do not go into the root cause of that particular behavior. Because if I know, if I'm a business person and I know that there's going to be, a, if I can use uh, Bulawayo's example, there's going to be a transport route but I don't have buses, I don't have access to finance, but I know that a, a friend of a friend who happens to know a big company mm. um, has all the resources, uh, but for those guys who get extra point, they need a, an African person, then I'll raise my hand and, and, and be part of that company. So we call that here, it's fronting. Mm. But it's caused by the fact that people are not able to access um, uh, um, required resources to take those opportunities. That's the first headache, it's fronting. The second headache, uh, it's about the quality of service. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, um, you can take uh, an easiest business to do, which is catering. Um, 
you know, uh, 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 African caterers or uh, uh, catering companies that are owned by African people at times uh, is supposed to deliver food at 12, but it will come at half past one and claim that there was a roadblock somewhere. Why? Because the guy does not have resources that are required. Yeah. And as government, at times we tend to be very harsh against such behavior without understanding that um, what is the cause? We are not dealing with the cause. Mm. The third uh, headache, um, it's, it's, it's on the policy itself at times, the supply chain yeah. or the tender process, things that are required from businesses. I'll give you an example uh, in this municipality around electricity. Um, the acting head of electricity in the few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, indicated to us that um, for a long time, people could not, you know, if your street pole is not working, you require a company to go and fix it, but it could not be given to a small um, a guy to do it. Um, the main reason being that he doesn't have a, a machinery that goes up and, yeah. and, you know. Now, the new system from the municipality is that where such doesn't exist, it, it, the municipality must intervene. It, mm -hmm. it, must, it must procure on behalf of the small guys so that they're able to, to come in. Mm. The last part is um, on the issue of uh, access to finance. Um, one of the things that we are doing now as the municipality to deal with that headache in the, in the new projects is to say that in, in as much as the payment, because it's also about cash flow, you might be able to get a loan from APSA or from Itala Bank, but if you are, you are not able to service, to service it on time, yeah. then there's a problem. The problem is caused by us at times. We pay late. Uh, we, don't, we are not paying on time. Instead of 30 days, we take three months. So it's a headache for, for us. It's also a headache for the small business. Mm. Now the question would be, what are we do, do, doing, doing to, deal with, this, yeah. Yeah, to deal with, with all of this? Um, if a company going forward, if a small company is going to be subcontracted by a big company, um, the issues of cash flow must also be dealt with by a big supplier or by a big company. Because, you, I mean, you can't, we can't have a situation where uh, somebody has done some work and um, we seem to be delaying in paying. We might be delaying in paying a small contractor, yeah. but our relationship must be with a big supplier so that a small guy is paid by a big contractor upfront, not wait for us to pay because our systems are so stringent that at times it kills the business. The business yeah. And in terms of dealing with professionalism and efficiencies, we are going to have a panel of contractors is closing sometime this month, I think by Friday. Um, we want to create panels of contractors that are going to be in the incubation program so that we deal with issues of, it, of uh, the efficiency and competitiveness of small contractors. So people are going to be in the panels and people are going to be trained. We're going to work with banks in making sure that there's funding mm. available for them to be able to do work. I really appreciate the, the frank way in which you've put these issues on the table because until they are confronted, we can't really begin to solve for them. Fronting, the quality of service, supply chain issues, and of course, access to finance, big issues that you put on the table. I, I wanna come back, Musa, to link a lot of what we've said and what we've heard um, uh, from Philip and what we've heard uh, from uh, Madame Zhu and link it back to the question of competitiveness. Whenever I have a, a conversation that I need to moderate that has got black in front of it, whether it's black youth or black women, and in this particular case, black business, for me, the natural question is, what is the significance of you being black in that space? So are we able to translate blackness into competitiveness? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, if you have a business that has low quality service, or you have a business that is going to give you issues around roadblocks, that being black is insufficient because ultimately the market demands quality and the market demands competitiveness. So for the black businesses in the room, how should we be thinking about how do we sharpen our competitiveness and make being black a, an attractive incentive for other partners and for the market to want to actually play with us? Okay, thank you very much for that question uh, because I think it's quite pertinent. Um, first of all, I think as black business, um, as my other colleague put it, 
we need to really develop self-love self to start with. Why self-love? Because if we love each other, we are going to see it important that we work together. What we do know is that at the moment we are not, we are operating our businesses as individuals, which is what she's talking about. We are not aggregating. We are not saying let's come together and see what we can deliver. Because amongst ourselves, someone else could actually have the resources that can support the other. So that then we know that um, we identify um, people that have got the strengths that we do in areas that we do not have, bring them on, on board so that then we can really uh, pursue excellence. We should not accept that um, ours should be that um, it, 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 you know, it's going to be acceptable if I have this excuse on, or not, you know, of, of not delivering excellence. If we are really wanting to, um, to compete out there, we should drive for excellence in our hair salons, we should drive for excellence even in our spaza shops as well, because if we don't, other people will come in, they will deliver that excellence, and then we'll wonder why, um, you know, uh, our businesses are not, are not uh, succeeding. Mm. Um, so it becomes important that let's start loving one another. Because if we love one another, you know there's something called social capital. Yeah. As black people, we do not have social capital because even where we come from, we are the first ones to be in business. I don't have an uncle and a, a long string of people that have been in business. So where are you going to get there? You're going to be getting that from the other black people that are mm. in business. So that's, that's number one. I think, um, well, that is going to allow us to pull resources and aggregate, as, as she says. I think number two, although I have already touched on that, is the issue of excellence. Let us strive to say I am going to deliver the, the best that I can. There are three things that businesses compete on. The first one is functionality. Mm. Uh, is this thing functioning that I'm delivering here functioning better than, is it the best? If it's not the best, is it number one or number two, you know? Rather than saying, oh, well, they'll, sh they'll understand I'm black, I'm not going to deliver this. So do you do your research? Do you, do you go out there and get, you know? Number two, so number one is functionality. Mm. Can you compete in that space? Number three is, um, sorry, number two is uh, aesthetics, beauty. People love beauty. People want to, deal, to have things that are beautiful. Is the area where you are delivering your business clean? Is it beautiful? Is it attracting? Because if you think you are just going to compete on functionality, people are going to say, you know what, I'd rather go where I'll get poor quality, but aesthetically this is be a better experience. And then the other area is the area of ethics. Um, you can take that as, as deep as you can. You have people that are working for you as a black business. How are you treating people that are working for you? Do they have contracts of employment? You know, do they, are they working the, the, the acceptable hours or are you enslaving them, making them work twice the number of hours that others work? Are you paying them on time? Or when you want to pay them, then you say, sorry, I can't pay you today, we'll make a plan for next yeah. week. Because that actually compromises your quality, the quality of your output. So these are the things that are real that we need to look into um, mm. if we really want to take advantage of all the other um, uh, assistance that and uh, people and that opportunities exist. Uh, that exist, absolutely. Well, as we take that short break uh, coming up now, I would never have guessed that this conversation would come down to self-love, but that's where we are. It's self-love and it's excellence. We're going to take a short break, but remember that when we come back from the break, we're going to be allowing our live audience here in Durban to participate in the conversation, and they'll be posing their own questions and comments and bringing the, through their insights into the conversation. If you're at home and you want to be a part of the conversation, you can certainly do that. We are on Twitter. The hashtag that we are using for today is Essence Fest DBN for Durban. That's Essence Fest DBN. And when we come back, we're broadening the conversation and um, introducing a guest from the USA who's going to be giving us a very interesting perspective on how this particular business became one of 
the, the world's second biggest uh, black business association, uh, a business association that started off uh, from very modest uh, points and today stands as the world's second largest as we continue the conversation on the growth and competitiveness of black business. We'll see you in two minutes. Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're joining us live from Essence Festival Durban. We're having a very insightful conversation here. We're looking at the business case for the promotion and the growth and the competitiveness of black business in South Africa. Before the break, we were hearing from the Durban Chamber. We're hearing from the municipality. We went over to Zimbabwe where we got the Mulawayo experience. We're going to bring in an additional voice now who's going to give us a global comparative analysis to go with and that's uh, Mr. Ron uh, Busby Sr. Uh, he is the president of the U.S. Black Chambers Incorporated. Thank you very much Ron uh, for making the time to join us in this second half before we go to the audience but maybe just give us the story uh, behind U.S. Black Chambers, the rationale for, for the chamber and why it exists and perhaps also the, the biggest success that you can claim to this day that has been done and, and bagged for black business. Thank you. Thank you to your audience as well as the rest of the panel. Thank you for having me this morning. Uh, as it was stated, I was listening earlier to some of the challenges. Just a second there, Ron. I think we just have a technical issue with the audio technical team. If you could please uh, assist us with that. But, um, and while uh, the, audience, the audio is being uh, taken a look at, let's, uh, oh, I'm told that I it's here now. Ah. Thank you very much. So Ron, let me yes. give you an opportunity to continue. Thank you. Thank you again to the audience, to the panel, as well as the, the presenters and the sponsors. I had the opportunity to spend a few minutes listening to the panelists earlier before I joined. Uh, and the similarities between what's happening here in Africa versus what's happening in America are very, very uh, similar in nature. Uh, one of the things that I've heard in reference to some of the challenges this morning is access to capital, access to opportunity, and access to sustainability within our own communities. The U.S. Black Chamber was founded in 2009 and we were founded on five key principles, principles that are global, principles that are concerns for African American businesses as well as African American communities across the country. And the first one being policy. What is happening in reference to advocacy, and policy because as we all know here, policy really drives where and how the government, uh, both from a federal, state, and local perspective, makes sure that its businesses and communities have great opportunities. And so for us, it was the first concern that we have to make sure that we had a voice. The second one is access to capital. And for too long, African Americans have gone to traditional banks for financing, for startup capital. And we as black people know that we are having challenges regardless of what our credit scores are, our acumen, or our skills, or business, uh, businesses. In America, the average African American is paying twice that of his white peers. We're paying nearly 20% for credit versus our white peers that are paying 10%. Having the same income, the same access, the same uh, businesses, we're paying twice as much for the dollars, and we're getting fewer of those. If I go to the bank and I say I need $100,000 to start a business or to grow my firm, typically they will give us half or less of the dollars that we need, which means that when we stumble, and all businesses do, we have a harder fall and it's harder for us to get up. So we partnered with black banks in the United States to ensure that our businesses are getting the credit that they need, yeah. 
at the interest rate that they need. And so for us, we're providing our own credit scores of 570 or, or below. In America, that is a relatively low credit score, and you can get up to $10,000 for a credit card for consumers and for our businesses, you can now get up to $100,000 line of credit. Our third one is really contracting, and we look at that from really three different vantage points. Where is the government spending its dollars? As we know in America, the government is the largest procurer of any product and service, and so we're there to ensure that they are having accountability to African-American businesses because we pay taxes as well. We also look at where is corporate America spending its dollars. As consumers, African-Americans are the largest consumer in the country. Most of our dollars are leaving our communities, going into the hands of outsiders. And so for us, we're making sure that corporate America knows that we are spending and we're watching where they're spending. And lastly, we look at each other and saying, as African Americans, we spend a trillion dollars. Mm. And that trillion dollars leaves our communities quicker than any other community. In America, the average Asian dollar stays in their community 28 days before it ever leaves. The Hispanic dollar stays in their community 21 days. The African American dollar stays in our community less than six hours before sure. it leaves. Which means that we're boycotting our own businesses. We don't have to worry about what outsiders are doing. When we control our own dollars, we can control our communities as well as our sustainability. And so for us, we've created a platform that's a digital, uh, that can be found on your digital phones that will allow us to find over 100,000 black owned firms so that we can control our dollars and when we're looking to spend money, we know where to find it. And more importantly, when we're looking to start businesses, I've heard the audience uh, talk a lot about starting up new businesses and what should they do. This will give you an accurate information about what we don't have in our communities. And so traditionally we go into the same businesses when many times if we started new businesses that we t traditionally support, we would have success. We also are uh, very concerned about entrepreneurial training uh, and lastly about chamber development. Some of the biggest uh, challenges as well as opportunities that we've had over the last couple of years, I just got back from China two weeks ago. And wh while I was there, I was very interested and their policy in reference to Africa. We all know that China has a big footprint here and a very big voice, but China understands that African Americans have the relationships yeah. with Africa. And if we could have the trifecta of China's resources, of African Americans' intellect, our ingenuity, our creativity, along with our brothers and sisters here in Africa, we can truly control our destiny as we go forward as a people. And so for us, we know that 98% of our dollars are spent outside of our country in reference to contract opportunities. We want to be the major player in that opportunity and growth of Africans as well as African Americans. Thank you very much for that contribution. I think it's been a beautiful triangulation. It's been a beautiful triangulation that's given us a really good, um, tangible um, insight into what can be done. We started speaking earlier today about the, prob the possibility of black banks, and here we're hearing that black banks do exist, and they do operate, and do put black people first. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to open up this conversation now. I'm not going to hog uh, these uh, panelists to myself uh, only. Please, if you'd like to ask a question, please kindly stand, introduce yourself, be short and sharp and indicate to whom you'd like to ask your question. Madam, we'll start with you. Please go ahead. Bonani. Kamalam Nutandum Kise. I'm from Impilent Events. The question Yami is for Ubabu Musa Makunga. Babu Musa Giguze Ukulum and quality of services that people. Abam Yama Bashulega, we render Risha before, but in a problem with our offices are a chamber of commerce. A chamber of commerce, Mofia Gona, Ufiga La Paya, Ungongos Mnyango, Uvulere, Umuta Vele, Avezelubusovaki, Abuzu Guti, Abesak Chel with Luzenga, and Besak Chel Lumuto for the last season, like Echo. It's been a year now. Some belly prize, a yacht, a membership. Prize as I told her last year, the same humble and this year. And our worry is that we are paying you a man. So the one year membership prize that was won last year is it expired. No, Tanda, thank you very much. Because our services, they are also of quality, whatever. Yeah. 
Ngebonga, thank you very thank much. You. So a quick translation. Uh, thank you, Noel Tando, for that contribution. So a quick translation for our non-Zulu speaking uh, members and audience. Uh, Noel Tando is concerned uh, by the point that was raised uh, by Musa on the quality of service of black business. And she is saying that if you reflect this back to the chamber itself, uh, there is questionable quality of service there. And she's sharing her own experience about having been to the chamber a, a number of times and not getting adequate service. And so she's saying, let's go back to our own homes and try and fix that before we speak broadly. Okay, I think I've understood it. Uh, less of a question, but I, I'm sure he will comment uh, on that. Thank you, Noel Tando. Let's get uh, to our next uh, question, please. Please go ahead. Um, Thank you, sir. Um, the name is Bonga Dlamini Otsakei, uh, the co-founder and executive chairman of the Gentleman's Hush Group, as well as the MD of Pereira Gamsadi. So, um, I'm speaking, uh, 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 my question is based on the SMME and directed to Mr. Philip Sitole. So looking at uh, the SMME sector uh, not being a competitive uh, compared to uh, uh, other countries with uh, a growing economy, the likes of Brazil and uh, uh, India, when you look into this, uh, uh, with their SMME, uh, which is in truth is MSME, macro, small and medium enterprise, uh, contributing uh, a, a sustainable, a sustainable jobs of about 90%, compared to the 60% of, of South Africa. So the sector itself is not competitive enough. So the question is then, how do we then uh, uh, go about in creating sustainable job through the SMME uh, uh, sector while looking at the, these barriers that are, 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 are facing the small businesses through uh, the tenuring system? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bonga. Let's take another question from the floor. Please, go ahead. Greetings to the house. Uh, this uh, is can you please speak up, please? Thank you very much. Uh, this is Sinetla from Zoma. Uh, I'm a director of a company called Kuzabov Surveillance. We're operating in a, a drone business. My question is directed to Mr. Stolle, Deputy City uh, uh, Manager. Uh, my question is, uh, what are the plans for the Etegwini Metro to support black-owned uh, drone businesses? I say this because there's so much we as black-owned drone businesses we can offer to the municipality. For example, uh, departments like city metro, disaster management, engineering, and fire and rescue, uh, they, they spend so much money hiring helicopters for areas uh, surveillance. The use of drones could be much more cost-effective. We can use our services in helping the municipality to monitor land occupants, crime, scripture, uh, suspected of harboring stolen copper, shakes, fire, so and disasters. Short and shop, Nintendo, short and shop. I think we Thank got the, the, the question. The question is how can we, uh, uh, opportunities for black-owned uh, black drone businesses, and of course going through uh, the uh, benefits of the drone business. I'm going to take one more from the floor because I've got a time constraint. Uh, Madam, you've already asked a question, so I won't take you. I will not be giving a question to anyone who's already asked. Sir, please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Farai. I'm from Pascalus Creative. We're a branding company. My question, I just got two questions. First question is, uh, how much uh, is the, um, the municipality uh, doing in terms of disseminating information to the communities, uh, the businesses in the communities, and also into the schools as well, because that the youth is the future business people, and uh, that's very important for that kind of education to go to the schools. Uh, uh, that's my first question. And then my second question is um, the big corporates as well, uh, I, I, would, I would want them to also, to also support uh, smaller businesses. I'll give an example of the modeling industry. Uh, we, we, one of our companies also does that. Uh, most of the models that you, most of the modeling models that are put out there when in terms of uh, advertising and all that are that there's so much stringent rules in terms of your size and everything but when you look at we are africans yeah. and typically an african body is not that slim and small but you find that the big corporates they just go on to uh, the white companies uh, who have this kind of size thanks for right thank you very much for that so let's come back um to so i think musa let's give you the opportunity to respond to Noel Tando on the quality issue yes uh, Nuru Tandu, thank you very much for raising that question, uh, which I think is a, is a, is a valid question, uh, taking the candidness uh, with which you have raised it. Um, it's good feedback for us. Um, 
we, we, it's something that we've picked up, and interestingly, we have stated that uh, very recently that we do need to build the capacity of uh, our chamber to be able to really st uh, strive for this excellence. Uh, I would really ask you uh, after this that I get your details so that I follow up with, uh, with my chamber staff. I really, I really am thankful to you that you raise it here because when you challenge the executive staff on the quality of the service that they deliver, they sometimes think, uh, well, he has smoked his socks, you know. <laughs> now, here it is on an international stage. We do need to, um, uh, to look into this. Thank you. I will take your details after Thank this. you very much for that. And this is the power of dialogue. So let's come uh, to, to you, Philip. And now, the question that was raised by Bonga was, uh, going back to the stats, that the majority of job creation happens in the informal uh, uh, sector and, and between or from small uh, uh, or micro enterprises uh, in particular. He says, what are the plans to deliberately focus intentionally on reducing the barriers for these uh, businesses so that they can grow? So let's, when we talk about growth and competitiveness, he wants to ensure that we're not just talking about big black business, but we're talking about black business across the board. Okay, no, no thank you very much. Um, the, I do agree with what uh, was said. I mean, that's a fact. Uh, but maybe the question is, what are we doing as the municipality? Um, firstly, I must indicate that um, uh, without boasting, but we are, the mu we are the only municipality in this country that has been able to have a, a, a small business fair uh, for the last 19 years um, uninterrupted. Why do we have the, the, uh, the business fairs? The business fairs are there for our small businesses for them to be able to showcase their products and services. So the city of Etewini or the city of Devon has spent more than 100 million in the last uh, 19 years mm. in terms of hosting that particular event. I mean, that's a huge investment is to give our small businesses a platform uh, so that they can showcase their products and services to potential customers. And we've got a lot of success stories out of those business fairs. Secondly, we have a um, memorandum of understandings with various financial institutions that are specific to certain programs. Mm. Obviously, they are not enough, um, but it's a good start. Um, it's very difficult to deal with banks, but we are excited that at least um, some of the banks have signed with us to support businesses that have won some work uh, within the municipality. The other issue was on the um, services that are normally seen as reserved uh, for certain racial groups. Mm. Um, the city has taken a stand by adopting the radical economic transformation framework. And over and above that, we've identified the sectors where we want to intervene. There are certain sectors, uh, as I've used electricity as an example, but even at engineering. The issue here, uh, I mean, that I want to address to the audience as well as everybody that is here, is around the so-called bid specification. Mm. If the bid specification is designed in such a way that um, it excludes certain people, it doesn't matter even if you can go and tender, you're not going to win that tender because it, it, it depends on how it is structured. Mm. Now, we, I mean, committees within the municipalities, tender committees have been changed. Firstly, we have changed the framework, we have changed the policies, we have changed committee members. That is to ensure that, I mean, this trans um, we are not saying that previous members were not transparent, but we are trying to improve the, the, the transparency around the tenders. But we are also targeting professional services because we can talk about construction. What about surveyors? What about yeah. engineers, lawyers, accountants? We want to bring them on board because that work, um, people are providing architectural services. We've got some of the best uh, um, architects who are African and black in this city but who don't get jobs. It all goes back to panels. They don't get these jobs because they're not part of the panels. That's why we have come up with a new paneling system mm. that is going to take care of our own uh, people who have been excluded in the past. The mayor spoke about this thing at length yesterday. Lastly, it's about the information, how do we disseminate yes. information? We've got various platforms uh, where we, de we, we disseminate information. This is one of the platforms. We are disseminating information about various programs that we have. We, we've got exhibitions, 
For example, we've got an exhibition starting on Friday until Sunday. We'll be having a stand, the Essence Devon Business Fair exhibition here at ICC. We'll be having staff from supply chain who are going to explain the new policies and the new framework. We'll be having staff from business support. We'll be talking about what kind of support will be provided. Lastly, we will be having staff that will be talking about um, uh, uh, work from human settlement uh, uh, cluster from trading services, which include water, waste, um, as well as electricity. This is all about trying to give out information. But giving out information is not enough. I, the issue here is once people have tendered, the committees must ensure that we follow the, the, the new systems. Mm. The mayor has stressed that even in the tenders that, have been uh, that were advertised last year, we need to go and revisit those tenders because some of them were not in line with the latest framework that has mm. been adopted. Mm. And I, I suspect a, a, another quick pivot on that uh, question, and if you could do a quick comment on this, is the flow of information. Because from what I'm hearing from Farai, Farai is looking to see information go, flowing to the communities and into the schools, and not necessarily where the schools and the community need to go and find the information by going to an exhibition or going to an expo. To what extent are we thinking about bringing the information into the community? Well, we are living in a digital world now. Mm. Um, uh, people can go to our websites. Uh, but what I know, maybe I'm old fashioned, <laughs> these uh, things of websites and uh, social media times doesn't work that well. People, they want to interact with a person directly. So what we have done as the municipality, um, we have um, uh, decentralized our services in terms of uh, the information offices. I mean, they're all over the municipality. Besides that, we also have what we call uh, business indaba, mm. or business is in business. We go to each and every ward uh, to, to explain. I mean, that's mm. how we, we, we disseminate information. But we also use community radio stations. Yes. Yes. Uh, and that's where you we see the improve. reach and the penetration. Yes, and we, and we take the point, we'll improve on those. And so we've got about five minutes before we get to the end of the show. Madam Zua, I'm going to come to you first, and then I'll come to you, Mr. Busby. But we, we've heard a lot uh, from the South African perspective. And I love the comment you started off with. You said, uh, in Zimbabwe, we had been liberated before South Africa. So we've been walking this road for some time. Yes. So if you could give South Africa one or two uh, pieces of advice that uh, from an, uh, 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 another uh, country that has been liberated before South Africa, um, and in particular in terms of pushing for the competitiveness and the growth of black business, what do you think South African government, whether it be national, provincial, or even at a local level, should be focusing on, focusing on to get it right? Um, I think the focus should be more on uplifting the disadvantaged communities. And you can only uplift them when you improve their competitiveness. A lot has been said about quality. What we have done as a city is that we have taken the youth to vocational training centers. There we train on quality, we train on business ethics, so that when they come out into the business world, they also know what is expected of them. But we don't throw them there. For instance, the food industry that was used as an example. Our health services department continues to monitor the, biz the food businesses and also occasionally calls them up for free trainings on, how, on food hanging so that we are sure that we can assure the public that contracts these people mm. that um, the quality, the of quality the is right. Mm. And also we urge businesses in our training to find your competitive edge. For instance, if you are in the catering industry, there's a lot of craze about the natural foodstuffs that are healthier and the likes. So concentrate on that. You know it better than everyone else when you, 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 you cook the traditional foods that people are into because of all these health problems that people are coming up to. But also, maybe just to add to what you are saying in terms of supporting these businesses, we as a city, as the city of Blaue, we were in a relationship with Etegwini mm. as sister cities, sister cities. And we have seen Etegwini sending South African small businesses to ZITF, to Zimbabwe International Trade Fair. That is giving them exposure right. to, to a, a trade fair that is international. And they interact, we, we exhibit on the same stand together with the Etegwini entrepreneurs. Mm. 
there we are get, getting them to see what the world expects of them. And they, I'm sure they gain something from, from that interaction. But also... As a final it, comment, it, Madam, I've got, two, okay. I've got 120 seconds left. <laughs> okay, sorry. But just the integration of the professional services as well. When we were independent, also in terms of, you use the lawyers, for example. The city has the city solicitors, like the, lawyer, the law firm that you use from outside. But what we did, instead of interrupting that relationship, we then divided for the conveyancing. We use all these other black law firms for debt collection, mm. which doesn't touch to the core of your solicitor's business. But you are empowering them and giving them a bit of business at the same time. And the final word goes to you, uh, Ron. Uh, again, it would be good just to get a consolidated reflection from you in about a minute and a half about what are the big ideas that you think you want to implant and leave here uh, as we wrap up this conversation? Thank you, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. One, I want to say, say thank you to the Durban South African Chamber of Commerce. We're signing an MOU with them this afternoon, and I appreciate that opportunity. Secondly, as an American, I want you to know that America is not what you see on TV. Uh, over the last year and a half, you've heard a lot of conversations going on about making America great again. Uh, African Americans came from this sand, came from this soil, and we truly appreciate and we call this home. In order for there to be a great America, there needs to be a great black America. And in order for there to be a great black America, there needs to be great black businesses. And in order for there to be great black businesses, we need relationships with the folk here in this audience, as well as around the globe. A lot of the challenges that our small businesses are finding when they deal with government as well as private sector is size and scale. Many corporations say they would love to do business with you, but you don't have the size and or the scale, you're too small. And so I challenge you to look to your left and look to your right and find other businesses that are similar in size, have a very similar mission and scope, and partner with them. Do joint ventures, do mergers, and if necessary, do acquisitions so that we can have the size and the scale upon the opportunity when it presents itself. Don't wait for the opportunity to come and then try to figure out how to get large. Let's leave this afternoon thinking about we want to be the largest businesses in the country as well as the world because we have across the globe the opportunity to grow ourselves to be the best people in the world. And with that, I say thank you on behalf of the United States. Thank you on behalf of the United States. Black Chamber of Commerce. Well, I certainly couldn't have wrapped up the show on a better note myself. And the final word is look left, look right, find a partner, aggregate and leverage your buying and your negotiating power. And that's the only way we're going to build great black businesses. For CNBC Africa, I'm Nozi Pombanjwa. Thank you so much for joining us.